my fellow dream chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? And today we head to Sherwood Forest as we explore the legend of Robin Hood, released in 1973. This film uh, was, uh, there's been a, this film has been like in the works for like, it was in the works for like a long time. Disney actually had ideas of creating this sort of Robin Hood film, uh, even before uh, round, round about the time Snow White was being made as well. Uh, but of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on board. I, it has been a long time coming. I was going to get him on board for Nightmare Before Christmas, but uh, and we were meant to get this. We were meant to get this episode done uh, about a month or so ago, but there has been a lot going on um, just with everything, everything happening yeah. in the world right now with lock, uh, with restrictions and uh, him moving house. But nevertheless. He's here at long last. It's uh, it's a good, it's another good friend from college. It's Jack. Jack, you finally made it to the Kingdom of Isolation. I, know, I mean, it has been months in the planning. I've been so excited to come on and, and do this with you. Like you said before, there was plenty of times that I we were at you had asked me before, and I just with life and stuff, it was just going to be impossible. So I'm go, so glad that I finally get to appear. Yeah. Oh, hang on. And my laptop has decided to freeze on me. That is not. Ideal. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, that, that is so typical. It's like my computer. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's uh, say, uh, say Jack's desktop decided to decided to uh, do an update once he yeah. uh, uh, what once he got Not a just a up. small update. Uh, pretty hefty update. It's going to uh, take a few of us. Deary me. Let's see if Control <laughs> Delete works. Oh boy, this oh boy. Bear with me, folks. Bear with me. Uh, if, I, if I, oh boy. If, Do you want to restart? Uh, oh, 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 now it decides to unfreeze. <laughs> <laughs> now it decides to unfreeze. Come on, laptop, work with me. Right, right. I think, I think that's us now. I think that's us. <laughs> I think. I don't know, but <laughs> I reckon run with. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm just. I'm. I'm. Well, I say because you know when life gives you lemons and all that. But uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, uh, Robin Hood. I uh, say this. Uh, it's a. It's a very well known um folk legend, especially in uh, especially in Nottingham, with the Sherwood Forest being in that sort of area, um. But we say this, uh, and of course this, and of course this won't this won't be the last Robin Hood um, film adaptation that has been uh, made because there's been a there's been there's been a there's been a number of them uh, made uh, since then. Not so much by Disney per se, but to other movie studios have made. Um, especially in recent Robin times, there's been a lot. There's a lot of Robin Hood films been made fairly recently. Actually, if I remember right, there's been quite a lot. Don't know if there's yeah. been a recent to them, but. Yeah, over the over the last decade, uh, especially. But of mm -hmm. course, we're, we're going to focus on the we're going to focus on the uh, animated classic from uh, Disney. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's head into Sherwood Forest as we talk about Robin Hood. And as always, spoiler alert in place if you haven't seen the film yet. As is a tradition, I have to put that spoiler alert in there on the off chance somebody might not have seen it. Uh, oh, I'm jealous. I might go to Sherwood Forest. <laughs> yes, the joys of having a green screen, folks. Uh, but yeah, um, so we get the open. So we get a we get a storybook opening, which we haven't seen for uh, we haven't seen for quite a while. Last time that was, well, we have technically we we've had a few storybook openings um, over the years. We had uh, Snow White. We had technically Pinocchio after Jiminy Cricket. Finished uh, when you wish upon a star. Mm -hmm. uh, what other ones have we had? Um, uh, C Cinderella. Uh, else we on? Nope. Peach Pan. No. Uh, Lady in the Tramp. No. Uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, Sword in the Stone and uh, Jungle Book before. Uh, before this. So, so yeah, not the first time we've had a storybook opening, but it definitely. Um, but. Um, I, I, I doubt it will be the last um, that we see it. But, um, but anyway, uh, we get one of the, um, 
we get one of the merry men who is a rooster mm-hmm. in the form of Alan Adale, voiced by Roger Miller. And they actually have the characters with their voice actors' names um, over the um, uh, the opening credits, which is accompanied by the which is accompanied by uh, the song "Whistle Stop." Which, uh, for those that are tuned into their uh, internet memes, folks, uh, yeah, it sounds v- it's basically the base for one of the earliest viral memes in the world. And Ross Carswell, this is just for you. Don't believe me, folks. This is the original whistle stop. And here is and here is what and here is uh, what it inspired the famous hamster dance. Roll the hamster dance footage, maestro. Yes, I did. I did. I did wind. Uh, I did wind Ross Carswell up with uh, with uh, the hamster dance on one or two occasions. <laughs> oh, he's 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 gonna he's gonna hate me for that now. <laughs> I, can feel, I can feel the rage coming in from post yeah. edits. Yeah, just um, I just need to be careful. I just need to be careful. I don't uh, come across him in the street. Otherwise, he's gonna use his uh, martial arts on me. I'm trying to be as is it, J- judo, that's what it is. I just need to be careful he doesn't use his judo on me. Uh, or, or his wrestling. No or, him, or his wrestling, for that matter, as uh, Corbin <laughs> Crow, which is his uh, uh, wrestling alias. But um, but yeah, t- but, uh, talking to martial arts, folks, um, a little bit off tangent, not the first time I've done it, won't be the last. Uh, Jack, did you see the teaser that just got revealed for uh, season four of Cobra Kai over the last couple of days? I haven't watched it yet. Just at all, I, I'm planning oh, you've on not it. Seen Cobra Kai at all? Not yet, oh, because it is I've not had a chance to. Worth it. But it is the minute I move from in here because I don't want to start it while I'm moving. The minute I get into the other place, I am going to be binging yeah. it because I'm really excited for it. That's it. It, it is. It is absolutely worth it. And uh, um, this is this is another project I've got in um, a sort of, sort of like side project in the pipeline, folks. I'm going to be going through my favorite. Cobra Kai moments from each of the 30 episodes. 30 episodes, one moment per episode. No pressure there. I've got the list set up. I just need to get the time to get the video put together because right now, as far as as far as the main projects I'm focusing on on my channel are concerned, uh, just Kingdom of Isolation and Formula One, those are like the two main ones that I'm focusing on uh, right now. So I don't give myself too big a workload. Uh, I'll do the occasional video game stream here and there, um, but that's just when time will allow. But yeah, uh, then we get into the very then we get into the very next song, which is uh, Udalali again, also performed by um, Roger Miller, and wow, it is it's just so laid back and relaxed. I mean, just that just that Sunday afternoon feeling, and you, and this is where we see Robin Hood with Little John uh, walking through the forest to take a page out of the uh, the lyrics. You've got uh, Brian Bedford. Uh, as uh, Robin Hood, and you've got Phil Harris in his third Disney film in a row after doing Baloo in the Jungle Book and uh, Thomas O'Malley in uh, the Aristocats episode. Mm-hmm. And those episodes you can see in the Kingdom of Isolation playlist in the top right of your screens. Um, so they're just, pl- just they're just um, they're just frolicking about, and then uh, the uh, the sheriff's guards they um, they try to. They try to shoot the arrows at uh, uh, Robin and John, but uh, to no avail. Um, and then, and then once that's out of the way, they once that's out of the way, they uh, they, they see this gold carriage um, going through the forest with uh, an elephant fanfare. Interestingly, because mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I mean. I mean, elephants' trunks used as trumpets. It's, uh, it's. I mean, I mean that pretty. That pretty it's much. Very Disney. Itself. See, we we'll say it's very Disney. Yeah, so that, that that pretty much that pretty much writes itself, folks. Um, and that's where we see Prince John and Sir Hiss, and uh, to say they have a dysfunctional relationship would be a massive understatement. Yeah, uh, and when I say dysfunctional, it's just. Uh, 
John really, oh, sorry, Prince John really hates Sir Hiss. But um, as far as as far as the voice cast is concerned, for that, uh, you got uh, Peter Peter Ustinov as uh, Prince John, uh, but he also voices King Richard, who is referenced uh, numerous times throughout uh, the film. And you've got Terry Thomas as Sir Hiss. And the l little interesting things regarding um, uh, there's a little couple of interesting things regarding uh, uh, Prince John and uh, Sir Hiss. So interestingly, um, when it came to, when it came to getting uh, when it came to like having to uh, effectively reshoot some of the um, uh, re-record uh, re some of the uh, the dialogue, they tried the Disney animators needed. Uh, Peter to come back to the studio to record some of his lines and they had made calls everywhere from the New York City, London, Paris, Vienna, even Tokyo just to try and locate the guy and only to find out that he was working at NBC Studios in Burbank that week about half a mile away from the, about half a mile down the, down the street from the studio. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, and the other interesting thing is the um, is that uh, Terry Thomas, the voice of Sir Hiss, he had a he had a gap in between his teeth, which worked in which worked in the favor of the uh, the animators for make, for designing uh, the character, and it was very handy. It made a very handy opening for uh, Sir Hiss's forked tongue to. Dart out. So very, very interesting how they're able to get those things to work in their favor. I mean, it's, it's just like Disney, especially with the character with the, the hissing, it's such a it's such a key thing that he can make that sound so well because of his kind of physical attributes. It's just insane how much thought it's put into each character. Yeah. Yeah. So and um and, and and Robin Hood and uh, Little John, they uh, they decide. Hmm, let's see what we can do here, and uh, they decide to disguise themselves as fortune tellers. <laughs> uh, yes, that do and yes, that does mean dressing in drag. Oh boy, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, dare I say, uh, for, for those tuned in, for those tuned in with their video games, I think these two were like the. Robin Hood, especially, were like the prototypes for um, for Agent Forty Seven in the Hitman series, uh, trying to uh, was like, subdue subdue your enemies and uh, taking their disguises to try and blend into your environment so that nobody's suspicious of you. So that, 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 that's how I that's how I see Robin Hood and Little John anyway. Yeah, I can agree. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, so they disguise themselves as fortune tellers, and uh, the the crystal ball they managed to get fireflies for the uh, for the for the glittery effect of the um, of the crystal ball, and this is all while and this is all while they're getting the jewels off uh, Prince John's rings. Um, and um, going like under like, and then, and then little John going under the uh, under under the treasure chest, which is being guarded by some uh, very what's what I'm looking for very serious rhinos. Was he? Was he? A little John uses uses um, a sword to. Get under the um, under the chest, and it's just oh, I can't even describe it. I, I I can't describe it without somewhat trying to demonstrate it, but I can't do that because of what I'm wearing. <laughs> oh, but yeah, um, he effectively uses his disguise to just bag all the coins from mm -hmm. the chest. They and then. And then, and then Robin and Little John, they um, they get what they need, and then boom, 
collision course and they're just like ah like we need we need to get this we need to get this we need to get this and then oh boy <laughs> and, and this is this is where we see the first signs of this the first of many signs actually for this dysfunctional relationship between prince john and sir hiss it's um so his warning, warning Prince John about um, the uh, about about the uh, fortune tellers being actually bandits, and the bandits end up being Robin Hood and Little John. They discover this eventually, and uh, so his is just like I, I I I I I warned you about this, but no, you wouldn't listen. Oh, it's just the uh, current theme is it just doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Uh, dare, I mean, dare I say, it brings a whole new meaning to uh, never trust a snake. But in this case, Prince John, you should have trusted this one. <clears throat> oh boy. I think I think the, the snake's so misunderstood. He only tries to help, and I'm pretty sure at one point he smashes a mirror over him. Yes. Yeah. This... Yes. He he does. Yeah. And oh. and and and, and, and he, even Sir Hess brings up goes, hey, no, no, no. seven years, boom, bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> and so and, unwarranted, so unwarranted. Yeah, uh, the the and one of the other recurring, one of the other running gags throughout this film is, uh, let's just say Prince John acts like a spoiled little brat, and I don't often use that. I I don't often use that word on here, folks. But it's in this case, it's warranted. It is justified. He's a spoiled oh, yeah. little brat. And every time his mother, every time his mum is mentioned, she's like, ah, mommy, and sucks his thumb. Yep. <laughs> I was like, I was like, if, if that's not the sign of a spoiled brat, I don't know what is. I remember when I was younger, that made me hate the character because it just, I, I couldn't stand someone so, so babyish. And I was a child myself at that point. But it used to really annoy me that, in my eyes, this, obviously not a man, but this grown up was acting so childish. It used to really annoy me. Which obviously goes well with the character, <laughs> and and if it and, and hey, it works. Yeah, it does. We should hate the character for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, then and then we get, and then we get another. It's. I mean, I mean, it's it's kind of a given that you have one, like at least one irredeemable character in yeah. a Disney film, especially in this particular, especially especially in this sort of era, but. Here, you've got like two. Possible. No, no, I, I was. I, I was going to say. I would argue two. I, I, I was going to say three, but Sir Hiss, he really gets the short end of the stick. Yeah, he's he's just trying to do his job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. The let's see. The other irredeemable character is the Sheriff of Nottingham, voiced by Pat. Uh, Pat Buttram. Uh, now. Uh, his voice sounds very familiar, folks, because I am certain he has been in Disney projects. Um, he has. He has been in Disney projects previously. He was Napoleon in The Aristocat. He was, he was, a, he was Luke, who is a swamp inhabitant in The Rescuers. And he's also... Uh, Chief, the hunting dog from uh, the Fox and the Hound, and uh, oh, how's about that? He's a uh, well, and th this is this is why I love going through the filmographies of these um, of these um, of of these actors. He was one of the tune bullets in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and he was one of the guys in the saloon. In Back to the Future Three, jeez, that's crazy. So another oh, fine example, that. another fine example of somebody with a very extensive uh, resume as far as like big films are concerned. I'd, I'd also argue he's in a lot of the maybe not as commonly loved films, uh, Disney films. Like he's yeah, not in. That's a valid point. Like, films, it's, films it's, that don't often get regarded as some of the best. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd argue against that fact, but yeah, they, they definitely, I mean, they don't get as much popularity as something like The Little Mermaid and all the kind of like Snow White and things like mm -hmm. that. 
Yeah. But it's, it's weird to see this this guy's been in a good a good chunk of them. I would I would argue. Yeah. And uh, and we and regarding films like The Little Mermaid, folks, I am get I am I am I'm not far off. Folk, I'm not far off getting started with the Renaissance period. After this episode, I've only got three more to do: Rescuers, Fox and the Hound, and Oliver and Company. Yes, I am recording these somewhat out of order, but they are. But the episodes are going up in order of when the films were released. So don't, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the summer is just going to be the Renaissance films. If I can get, if I can get like, if I can get like, I say the goal is to get one one of those films done a week if i can get two done on if i can get two two of them done on like uh, one or two occasions that's a bonus because it gives me because it means it, it gives me more time in the editing process uh to be able to make the make those episodes as best as be, as best as possible because the renaissance period very significant uh, era for the uh, for the Disney uh, for the Disney Studio, but also a very special period for us growing up because those film those films that came out at that time were effectively our childhood. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean especially the especially the early ones, Little Mermaid, all the way up to The Lion King. Mm-hmm. And yes, I'm including the Rescuers Down Under in that one. Criminally underrated. Very much so. Have to agree with you there. Put that into the notes. I'll I'll, ex- I'll I'll explain to Jack off camera. Um, I'll I'll explain to Jack off camera regarding uh, the uh, the the notes I just put down. Um, yeah. So uh, once that once that's out of the way, we get uh, we get introduced to some of the other. We get introduced to the rest of the um, the characters. You've got it's I say it's, it's it's a wide range of as you've got Adam Devine being Friar Tuck. You've got uh, Carol Shelley as Lady Cluck. She is just hilarious and you've got uh, monica evans as uh, maid marion and you've got and you've got you've got you've got some of the you've got some of the others um you've, you've got you've got a lot of the kids um you've got, you've got the kids uh, there as well you've got uh, john fiedler and barbara luddy both also done previous uh, uh, disney projects well john fiedler especially being the voice of Piglet for the Winnie the Pooh shorts, which would end up becoming the many adventures of um, of Winnie the Pooh. Because Barbara Luddy has done a lot of um, Disney projects uh, previously. She was in uh, she was in Lady and the Tramp. She was in Sleeping Beauty, Hundred and One Dalmatians, um, and she she's also done a couple of she's also she's also got a couple of other um, film credits to her name. She's got a a, a film entitled Terrified from 1962 and a TV film Lost Flight in 1969. She's got a few, mm-hmm. she's got a few TV roles to, uh, to her name as well. Uh, so Barbara Luddy, she's the voice of Kanga in, the, um, uh, in Winnie the Pooh. And let's see, so Barbara Luddy, she's the voice of uh, Mother Sexton and uh, Mother Rabbit, even though she's, uh, even though she's uncredited for, um, for that particular role, which is which is a bit which is a bit unfortunate, which is a bit unfortunate because um, you do you do get those. Um, it is inevitable that you end up with those um, voice actors that you recognise the name, but you recognise the voice, but they end up going uh, uncredited uh, un- until until it's brought up in in series like like this one or in like other. I think you make a very good point, though, that Disney seem to reuse a lot of voice actors for their films, yeah. and it does give me a sense of familiar, familiar. Oh my god, familiarity. There we go. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> when you're it. I mean, there, there was a couple of times, like you said, when I was uh, watching this film, mm-hmm. and I was like, I recognise that voice. I yeah. just couldn't place where it was from. Yeah, and say, but say, but say, what, what, so what, what are the most fa- one of the f- most famous people? That they that Disney have used, especially in recent times, as far as uh, long term Disney collaborators is concerned, is of course the man, the myth, the legend. That is of course Jim Cummings. I mean, I mean, you you, you name you name a Disney film from like nineties onwards. You name a Disney film from that particular era onwards, or a Disney project in particular, uh, be it be it a film, a TV show, or even Pete in Kingdom Hearts. Yes. <laughs> I mean, 
I I I, ha- I have to I have to get that I have to get the, I have to get the, the little uh, Kingdom Hearts plug in there at some point. It's just it's just a shame that Robin Hood isn't one of the worlds that we explore in the in the Kingdom Hearts series. I would never say never though, as they did say a uh, make in the last game that from that for moment onwards they're going to look and introduce worlds that they haven't introduced. So you never know. The scenes if we go to the Black Cauldron. Oh, don't get me started on that. That's that's my I've argued for that since day one. The, the, <laughs> oh, I think the scenes if we get to the Black Cauldron, folks. Oh, I've argued for it. Who, Especially who have... the darker worlds as well. They, they're yeah. looking at more in the darker tales. Is it, uh, it, it's... Who who are they gonna who are they gonna have to voice the Horned King now that John Hurt's passed away? Unless they use know. archive footage. They very well could. They very well could. It would work still. Yeah. That's, they'll it, it, they'll, they'll work see, something out. Yeah. It'd be good to see something like Robin Hood as well, though, because Robin Hood, yeah. there's, there's so much... It, it is very English fantasy, but it works really well. And even watching the film, I don't think it looks very... Uh, it's such an interesting place, just visually, mm-hmm. through just watching the film. I would, I would like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean here, here's a couple of ideas. Square Enix, I hope you're listening to this. Uh, I'll say, I'll say, Black Cauldron, Robin Hood, Mary Poppins. Yeah, you've got definitely. the you've got the heartless taking the form of chimney sweeps. Oh no! Yeah, because now with the new the new physics engine, you could jump between buildings. And yes, I t- and yes, folks. Just as a quick heads up, yes, I did take that idea from uh, Gerard the Completionist, to uh, when he covered the uh, the Kingdom Hearts games uh, on 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 his Completionist YouTube channel. E- even he suggested heartless as chimney swe- the heartless as chimney sweeps in Mary Poppins, and I'm and even I, I, I was just like, you, yeah, I'm on board with this. <laughs> I'd wager you Moana because the final boss could be defeated because technically. Oh, technically, she has a hotness. The... Square Enix, get onto that. Get onto <laughs> that one, Square Enix. I would be all for it. Oh man. I mean, I mean, the scenes if they get Dwayne Johnson to voice a, mm. in a Kingdom Hearts game. The scenes if they do that. They could just say you're welcome. Bang, easy joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that yeah that that one's way too easy. But uh, but yeah, back back to Robin Hood. Um, you've got you've got the, you've got this family of rabbits. They are uh, you've got this family of rabbits. Um, uh, and the kids are Skippy, Sis, and uh, and uh, Tag Along. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I never knew that was a name. That's amazing. Okay, okay, very very interesting names there. Um, let's see, let's see. It's it's the it's the birthday and uh, the sheriff of Nottingham comes comes in, uh, and ju- and just oh, establishes shit. his irredeemability right out of the gate. Just the very the very first scene we see the sheriff. I think it's the first scene where we see uh, Otto. I think, and he, obviously he, he's been a tax collector for the king, and he's taken every penny from everyone he can get. And Otto has a cast on his foot. He's a bit crippled at that point. Oh yes, and he lifts. He he hides the money and he's um, in the cast. Yeah, in the cast to try and hide it. And the sheriff was like, "No, no, I'll still take that. Don't you worry. I know what it is." Oh, I, I think that it's such wow. a good way to introduce a villain character because, as much as I think something that we've not really mentioned yet is they've changed all the characters from humans into animals. Yeah, I because... think to make it a bit more lighthearted. Yeah, because it's quite a. <laughs> Quite a rough tale, really. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, I say it's, I say this is like the first proper film that they've done uh, mm. with uh, anthropomorph. Well, one of the first that they've done with anthropomorphic animals, uh, like in other words, like having animals live as live and act as uh, human beings. Um, we have had, we have had Disney films uh, previously and since that have a that have just animals as uh, the characters. I mean, Bambi, a prominent example. And then, of course, you've also got The Lion King. Thing is, they do something quite interesting in this one, and it's that the, a lot of the um, kind of poor residents of the world are all 
considered prey in the animal kingdom, and all the people that are nobles and like the kings and stuff all would, would be considered more higher up in the food chain. So that's oh, why yeah. the when you see the rabbits, they're obviously can quite easily prey for most animals. That's why they are at the bottom of the kind of hierarchy in this kingdom. And it's really mm. quite smart how they did that because you could you can automatically then kind of tell everyone's status by what animal they are. I never, I never actually picked up on that now that you've mentioned it. Hey, well, well spotted, folks. I think, I think um, for most of them, I don't know. I can't remember if there's anything that breaks that trend, but I definitely, uh, when I was watching it, picked up on it. Yeah, I was saying, I was saying, and then you've and then you've got the church mice, which are like right down at the bottom of that mm -hmm. um, um, that hierarchy. But I say, well, I say, well, well spot, well spotted on there picking that up. I say, I, I say that that's something I wouldn't have, uh, that's something I wouldn't have um, uh, well, like, picked up like on. The, the clock, uh, the clock. My God, the chicken is ah, a, yes, is the kind of maid, if I remember right, to. The assistant to me, Marion, yes. Yeah, that's the that assistant. That's what I was looking for. Um, and that's because, obviously, she is considered prey as well. But she, I would argue, maybe is a wee bit better. Like, I don't know how that works out, but I know that foxes usually eat chickens. So to have an assistant to a fox is just a very strange choice. Yeah. But um, but, they, but, 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 the fact that, but the fact that you get, but the fact that you get those, um, because, I mean, previously you've had foxes being, uh, being like the bad guy, in particular, Honest John mm -hmm. with um, Pinocchio. So to be able to get a fox as a protagonist and the hero of the film, mm -hmm. it, 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 they, it was it was a big ask. Yeah, I mean the key the key kind of thing that people kind of identify foxes with are cunningness, and he is very cunning, but he is also very kind. Yeah. And, so, and and if and dare I say, if anything, folks, the way the sheriff of Nottingham acts throughout the entire film is it's it's it holds a lot of weight, especially today. Mainly mainly on the political side of things, but I'm not gonna even gonna I'm not even gonna <laughs> touch that patch of turf. Because chances push are that right away. <laughs> yeah, because chances are I probably won't have a clue what <laughs> on earth I'm talking about. <laughs> But but those but those that are clued in on the political side of things, you'll probably be able to fill in the blanks. But yeah, um, and then and then you've got uh, Robin Hood disguised as uh, as a blind man, and mm. and he and um, I like, and and the kids don't realize they don't realize it's Robin Hood until he actually reveals himself and. He, he, he manages to help make uh, the kid's birthday a bit um, much better after uh, the sheriff took the took uh, took that farthing that uh, that he got um, yeah and even, even even gives the mother a, even gives the mother a, um, a small bag of cash as well and gives and gives the kid uh, a bow an arrow and uh, and his hat as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's really smart how they did it because usually in Disney films when pe characters are in disguise, even at the start of the film when they're dressed up as the the fortune, fortune tellers, dealers, you can kind of tell that they aren't real. But with this disguise, it was it actually caught me off guard because I was like, I could believe that this was a blind man. Yeah, we just how well they had designed the the disguise because it wasn't it wasn't over the top and something that most people are looking at the screen like you should know that's not who that is. Like with this disguise, yeah. it was probably really well designed to be very simple, but it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say, and uh, I say, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, Otto uh, earlier. I say he he's done he's done a couple of Disney projects previously as well. He was uh, in the Adventures of Ichabod and Mister Toad. He was in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, he was uh, ja he was Jasper and the Colonel in Hundred One Dalmatians. Uh, as well, he was he was even in uh, he was he was uh, he's, he's he did a few characters. He did Pearly Drama, the Master of Hounds, and the Huntsman in uh, in Mary Poppins, albeit uh, uncredited. He was uh, Colonel Hathi in the Jungle Book uh, as well. So he's, I think, again, 
another another long time Disney collaborator, and he's he's done a few other he's done he's appeared in other he's he's appeared in a few TV shows uh, since then as well. He's uh, uh, he was um, was it uh, pro- probably one of the most famous shows he was in. He was uh, he was in an episode entitled "Return of the Ridge Raiders," where he played Henstep in the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> Okay, General Lee, jeez, okay, I get it, jeez, calm down. Seriously, it, it seems like every time, every time I cover a film from this particular era, there's always something that woman interrupts, that just interferes and just, <laughs> uh, really grinds my gears, folks. But, uh, yeah, oh boy. But nevertheless, the, there's an announcement that's made where they have um, an archery tournament and the winner of this tournament gets uh, a kiss from Maid Marion, which Robin Hood is like, yes, perfect opportunity. And he disguises himself as a stork for this. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and when this announcement is made, uh, it, this is also where we're introduced to Friar Tuck, uh, who is voiced by, as I say, uh, Andy Devine, I've, uh, I've mentioned as well. Um, he's the town's He's the town's local priest, and he's portrayed as he's portrayed as a badger, uh, and he's was a very noble. He's he's willing to go to extra lengths to protect, um, to protect the um, uh, the villagers of uh, Nottingham, and they. So the archery tournament takes place, and and this is why you've got little John um, with a, with another one of the. Uh, 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 with another disguise, he's just, uh, uh, little jo- uh, bear with me. Uh, ah, the Duke of Chutney <laughs> is okay, is Chutney even a real place? I don't think so, but I have been wrong before. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's also good to note that this is another one of those disguises that is terrible. It is it's so obvious. I mean, oh. I mean the top half of this is the top half of the disguise doesn't even fit him. No, it's so bad. <laughs> but yet nobody but yet no yet nobody suspects a thing. Not not even remotely. <laughs> not even Prince John, who's sitting right next to him. It's the it's the monocle that got me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. I think, and, and and Sir Hiss is still trying to tell Prince John just like, hey, it's, mm, it's these guys. But again, I, he doesn't listen. So underestimated. He is such a smart character to see through all these very, very, very bad disguises. <laughs> I don't, I also must know one of my favourite parts of the film was seeing him dressed up as well, basically made into a balloon. That had like oh, that! <laughs> that was yeah. just... And, and, then uses, and then using his tail as a propeller, as a major yeah. airship. What I will say though is, see the stork disguise that Robin has? I mm. will say it's another one that you could argue that is very good, that you could get away with it. I, w- I would argue it looks so much better than what what some of the other disguises than what, than what little John was wearing. I mean, and, and oh, that, even even dis, even despite the uh, the wooden poles as makeshift mm-hmm. legs, I still I still I would argue that it looks really from a distance maybe, but I don't I don't think it looks as bad as I'm I'm using the fortune teller as the one I'm thinking of, and the fortune teller one was. Whew, you could, you could, you could, you could just tell that was too. You could tell that was just two men in drag, effectively. Yeah. Whereas this, the stork one, even though it's wooden legs, the beak doesn't look like it's not supposed to be there. It's really, really, really well done. I would argue, even the yeah. the kind of feathery hands. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the archery tournament takes place, and the two finalists end up, of course, being the sheriff of Nottingham. Oh shit, that he is. Uh, yeah. And uh, there we go. Perfect example there of why he's a cheat. And he's, he's, he's being yeah. booed by everybody. I mean, of, I mean, of course he'd be booed. He's the Sheriff of Nottingham. He's keep, he just keeps, he's just taking the money for himself and just giving it to the king, uh, Prince John. Mm. 
The king is King Richard Fraser. <laughs> yeah, no, I made that. I made that mistake a lot. So bear with me if I say that. Yeah. Uh, and, and yes, Prince John thinks he is the rightful king of England. Yeah. He very much acts like it. Yeah. Another fine example of him being a spoilt little brat. Yep. He's like, but um, I said the uh, but, but the uh, but the stork. Was like, well, I'll just say, Robin Hood ends up winning the tournament, um, in very comedic circumstances because because the arrow, the first arrow he hit he fires is going nowhere near the target, but then he decides, you know what? Boom! Is that is that against the rules? I mean, in fairness, he got cheated on his first shot, so two cheats equal a right, I suppose. Yeah, I guess it levels himself out. I was like, you know, remember, remember just... right? Yeah, tips his bow up when he's shooting. If I remember right, he, yeah, he, he hits it with the bottom of the, the bow, so the arrow goes up into the sky. But then he shoots oh, the arrow. Oh yes, yeah, so he did. Yeah, yeah, he tips it, and then when he shoots the arrow in the sky, he shoots it so that it will land. So it's technically still the first arrow. It's just been helped a little bit by a second arrow. That's hey. really just a twig. Yeah. <laughs> And he, and he manages to split. He mm-hmm. splits the sheriff's arrow that's in that in the bullseye, and his Robin ends up winning the ends up winning the tournament. And then, and then John fight, and then Prince John finally, boom, exposes him, exposes the stalk as Robin himself. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it, it it starts to go south. But then all hell breaks loose and you get this proto Scooby-Doo-esque chase where you've got everybody. Uh, and, and that's on top of the, uh, the sword fighting that Robin's involved with. You get, you get all side characters. You've got these like, you've got this like several rows of tents mm-hmm. and you've got like the characters going like every, every which way uh, at, at some point during the chase. And it's just, oh, nothing. <laughs> Ooh. Just just before the chase as well, we get to see another moment where uh, Prince John is an absolute spoiled brat. When, he, for example, they they get uh, Robin and Marion to basically confess a love to each other, and you could tell that he's rubbed the wrong yeah. way. And then ev- when he everybody starts chanting, um, "Long line, long line, the, the king, king Richard." He's like, "No, I'm the king. No, I'm the king." <laughs> oh dear. But um, it's just it's so so silly, <laughs> but yeah. it's so good. Let's see. And uh, oh wow, <laughs> so um, so yeah, um, so, so Sir Hiss ends up being uh, he's he's trapped in a barrel of ale by Friar Tuck and Alan Adale, who's also at the uh, the tournament as well. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. You know, something, something I think we, we should mention as well is this film actually gets a wee bit dark because if I remember right, in a lot of Disney films, they don't necessarily say that they're going to kill a character, but in this, this film, they straight up say, oh, yeah. kill, I want them dead. Like, I want you to kill Robin Hood. We usually it'll be like, I want you to capture or I want you yeah. to deal with. But in this film, they explicitly say, I want you to kill Robin yeah. Hood. Was it, was it, was it, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, a couple of other examples for that. You've got you got Snow White, the sleeping death from the poisoned apple, mm. sleeping beauty, Maleficent, the spindle, spindle mm-hmm. of a spinning wheel and die. It's just it's so. If you think of the, the films now, you never get anything. I, I, I can't I can't remember in recent Disney history they have anything that I don't know just that quite kill kill such a strong word. Yeah, and it's not one that's used a lot in Disney films, so it's just yeah. strange that. Was like, was it, there, there is there is one from uh, the first Frozen film. Don't worry, folks. I'm looking forward to covering that one. <laughs> yeah, because I have quite a lot of bones to pick regarding that particular <laughs> film. Yeah. So yeah, you'll definitely want to tune in for that one, folks, because there's a lot that I want to pick apart with that one. But anyway, uh, let's see. There's one particular part in. Frozen, uh, wait, it's uh, Prince Hans. He says uh, he charges Elsa with treason after he claims that Anna is dead uh, mm. because, of, because of what happened uh, earlier in the film. Um, charges Elsa with treason, 
sentenced to death. Uh, I, I, th I, th I think that's the most recent one. Yeah, they, they use, I'm pretty sure they do use like the word death a lot. Um, but, they don't out, more, but they don't outright say, yeah, I want to, to kill someone. you. Yeah, it's just, it's such a strong word that you don't hear in a lot of Disney films and it really took me off guard. Again, I had I ha before this recording, I hadn't watched Robin Hood in quite a quite. I mean, it's been a few years, and I forgot how. I don't want to say different because it's not. It's got that Disney magic, but it's a lot mm -hmm. darker for something that has been made to be so kid friendly. Yeah, and um, but yeah, was it was it as 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 far as far as like full dark territory is concerned? I think the Black Cauldron is probably the closest. Oh yeah. The Definitely. closest we've got to effectively a Disney horror film. Yeah, I mean, I, I was terrified of it as a kid, and that's why I loved it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people were, but um, it's uh, but yeah, I'll say well, so we'll, we'll we'll cross that. We'll I'll cross that bridge when it comes to covering that film, um, mm. uh, in, in a couple of episodes time because I guess I've got because uh, I've got Winnie the Pooh, Rescuers, Fox in the House. So I've got I've got like. Two or three episodes beforehand before we get into uh, Black Cauldron, but yeah. But like I said, folks, I'm get like like I said earlier, folks. I'm recording these episodes out of order, but they are going up in order of when the films are released. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's say, uh, let's say Robin escapes with uh, Marion Little John. He escapes with all those guys, uh, and. We um, we end up with a celebration party with the with the um, with the next song in the film, the phony King of England, and this is where we have, in my eyes, probably the most prominent example of recycled animation. I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not joking, guys. I mean, throughout this film, this is probably this is this film out of out of the films from this particular era. Are concerned. This one, this one probably has the most recycling that I've seen from any Disney film, be it from the animation, voice actors you can forgive them for, but 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 even some of the sound design using the same and um, and and dare I say the music score is well done again by George Burns. There's you've got you've got the fanfare. The, there's dare I say there's not really much of a score. In, in this yeah. in this film, I mean, I mean it's and, and of course, those who know me well know when it comes to film soundtracks, first thing I go to is the score, not the songs that are featured. Mm -hmm. No, I, I do think you're right there. I'm pretty sure at this time they did reuse it a lot. I mean, a very prominent thing is like that. Like I think the most famous kind of example of them reusing things like that is the Cinderella dance sequence where they use it again. And oh, what film is it? Completely, the minute I said it, they they reuse it in a few films. I'm pretty sure. I'm I'm pr I'm pretty sure that they might. Oh, they they might they might have actually used it in Sleeping Beauty. They might have done. I think. Yeah. No. 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 I think you're right. I think it's in the Sleeping to, Beauty. It is towards the, the end of the film. Shot. Towards the end of the film. That's what it is. The exact same shot. With, even if you look at some of the characters, I remember right. Some of them are very similar. And just they've changed. I think they've changed colours around, and then they've changed obviously ah, oh, yeah. the people that are dancing. But mm -hmm. it's so at this this stage in Disney, they were they did reuse a lot of things. But again, I think that all comes down to how time consuming yeah. creating the animation it, was. Yeah, because because the budget because the budget for the film was uh, it was it was five million dollars. So so it was a little bit more than. It was a little bit more than films like The Jungle Book and uh, and The Aristocats, the two films that were done previously, but but even then, even then the films were still making the, the films were still making plenty of money. So dare I say you you could you could have used a you could have used um you could have uh, created more original animation rather than yeah doing I a think lot of a lot of, the, a lot of the money might have went into drawing backdrops because a lot of the backdrops are very unique to this film. Like I don't think there's a lot of Disney films that are very similar to this one. That would maybe reuse some of the same kind of like uh, you could uh, argue the forests, mm -hmm. but I think they they took it back from having these kind of almost mystical kind of magic forests to yeah. a very kind of so, so, so like grounded, 
grounded in yeah, reality. Yeah, it's grounded in just realism. Even yeah. though all the characters are animals, the the backdrops and the houses are very realistic to the time. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think, I think, as, uh, I think, I think, in the Phony King of England sequence, I think you've got, you've got, um, you've got bits of animation that were recycled from Snow White, Jungle Book, and even their previous film, The Aristocats. So, so yeah. those are like those are like the three main ones that are recycled in this sequence. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, don't get... very much feel, it feels very. It feels like you've seen it. It feels very nostalgic watching it. And yeah. obviously, I do, it. I do. What I will say is, I do think they do make it interesting by having all the characters very uh, have a lot of expression and a lot of kind of personality in them. But I do think yeah. it's very evident. Yeah. But I mean, don't get me wrong. The song itself is fantastic, mm. but it's it's just it's just my main criticism is just how much recycle how much recycling they did throughout throughout this film. What I will say in that scene it is one of my favourite looking scenes, and it's just with the fireflies as they're walking through the forest uh, at night. They've got a uh, I'm trying to remember. It's like red, three kind of red lights. And, th and this actually ties into the next song, Love, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Song, folks. I didn't even know that. And, and, it's, as a, and it's it was very rare that, it was very rare for Disney at the time to be nominated for uh, Best Original Song at, like, uh, mm. at the Oscars. I mean, I mean they, they did, I mean, they did win Oscars for the, the music from uh, Mary Poppins, uh, and the Jungle Book, they did win Oscars for that, but um, but, they, but the awards wouldn't start flooding in properly until the start of the Renaissance period. You know, I will say it's quite a surprise because the music for Robin Hood, as much as it's enjoyable for me to like when I'm watching it, it's not music that sticks with me as maybe some other Disney films do. Yeah. So it, it's, it's don't get me wrong, I'm happy that if they win any awards because I'm such a huge Disney fan and I think with the amount of effort that goes into these films it's yeah. definitely it's just it's, that was a surprise to me and I'm, I'm glad to hear it because I do think Robin Hood is so underappreciated it's nice to see mm -hmm. at least at the time them getting some recognition for it yeah because the interesting thing is the film initially did receive a lot of um, a lot of critical praise but then that reception became mixed in, mm -hmm. in recent years I think though the issue is a lot of people compare them to the stuff we're getting now, and they, are, when you watch back old Disney film, the backdrops are all hand drawn and all the characters are hand drawn, and yeah, you can't match the same amount of well, you can't have as much happening in the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Whereas in modern, I mean, even looking at, for example, the the trailer to Luca, the new Disney Pixar the film. They, which is they, which is which is coming to, I say, and and Luca is coming to uh, Disney Plus um, mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the summer, folks. And don't worry, once I've got these animated films out of the way, I am. I say, th this is a this is a long term project, folks. This King of Isolation ain't going anywhere anytime soon. I've got the animated films, I've got the Pixar films, I've got the live action remakes, and yes, I'll cover the director video sequels. I am That's going it. to cover those. Don't you worry. Yeah, I'm determined to be back. Don't worry. Yeah, because because right now, from what's uh, in the pipeline, uh, and that's and that's without taking the specials into account, I've got somewhere in the region of about a hundred episodes of this mm -hmm. series, and that's combining everything: the animated films, the Pixar live action. You make, a, you make a very good point there. Uh, the reason this is so mixed is because they've got hundreds of films now that people compare this one film to. Yeah, exactly. Because this yeah. title is so. Disney, essentially. Yeah. People now compare this film to everything that's come out now, as well as things that came out in the kind of early 2000s. And I think it's it's not fair to compare them all together because this film, at the time, was... I mean, even now I can say that this film is stunning. Yeah. Just watching it. And I can... But taking just, what I've seen from Disney now out of it, mm -hmm. this film stands up still. Yeah. To me, the effects they had. Yeah, I was about to say, regarding the visual effects especially, I mean, a couple of... A couple of great examples of that like the very the two the the very first disney films snow white and pinocchio snow white the transformation sequence for mm -hmm. uh for, for the for the, uh, for the evil for the evil queen 
that transformation sequence, that was all hand drawn, folks. Same with same with um, same with dare I say the very intensely dark moment of uh, Lampwick transforming into a donkey in Pinocchio. But again, transformations all hand drawn. There was no computers back then. Seeing seeing those moments happen seeing those old seeing those older sequences and and dare i say comparing them to like stuff you can do easily today without much difficulty i have i have always had a deeper appreciation of the older hand drawn films i think i think they stand out so uniquely and I, I must say that robin hood as much as it reuses animation i think the visuals and I've, I mean, I may be wrong here, but the some of the effects in here, I'm pretty sure, are computer generated, and it would have been very early days, like the fireflies. I'm pretty sure would have been, they, and they, they, I mean, they, this, this, they must have been. They, they would have been, been very early days of computer animation, and to be honest with you, they worked so well, just for something so simple as a, a little red light, but it really helps add to this otherwise quite sterile scene, which doesn't move. But it's, I, st I, st I can't say it enough that these films do stand up and I do think they're worth the watch. And Robin Hood specifically, the character design as well as the backdrops design, even just the animation, as simple as it is, is still stunning to watch. Yeah. As long as you take into mind where it came from and what time it came out. I think that needs to be said. You need to understand. I mean, even looking at your backdrop, the, the mm -hmm. amount of detail that goes into the backdrops, you can see it straight away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and and, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I've started, and it's one of the reasons why, starting from Sleeping Beauty, that I started incorporating these backdrops into in, into the series. I'm I'm still I'm still trying to find ways of being able to uh, further improve the uh, further improve this series because uh, I mean. I mean, I've got, I mean, I've got the back, I've got the backdrop, I've got the, um, I think being able to use footage of the film, but I've got to be careful with how much I use because copyright, especially with how protective Disney are with it. Uh, might, I might reach a point. I might reach a point, especially during the Renaissance period, might reach a point there where I might be able to start using the film soundtrack. Yes. I, I, I mean. I mean, yes, it's gonna, yes, it's gonna get, uh, it's gonna be a copyright ID from Disney right out the gate. But the Renaissance, the Renaissance films, especially, I see, I see, some, I see, just the soundtrack as a whole, the score and the songs, absolutely incredible. Mm. Uh, they, they have so much atmosphere. Yeah, and I think because they had the lack of animation in the backdrops, I feel like the score really does help give to life these these yeah. scenes mm -hmm. yeah that's it that's it i will i will say this as far as film scores i say film scores from the renaissance period are concerned i would definitely say the lion king for me is up there as uh, as what one of the best up there i mean I mean, I mean, I mean. Yes, it's the only os It's the only score that Hans Zimmer composed that he managed to get an Oscar for. But hey, can't argue with can't argue with the you the biggest Oscar animated film at the time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I would say my two favorite parts of the score are the stampede sequence and with how that and just that whole, the way that whole scene was put together. Yeah. That's my favorite. I have to agree. Uh, and, the, and the other one is at the end where Simba takes his place as King of Pride Rock. Just mm -hmm. it's just the emotional swelling of the score. It's to me, it's one of those once in a generation. Yes, mm -hmm. once in a generation, folks, moments uh, that just define storytelling in in the world of cinema and. I say, and, and I don't often use I don't often use once in a generation, but when I do, to me, there's a reason it's very special. I mean, Avengers Endgame, that portal scene, that was that was this one that was this generation's once in a generation moment for me. Anyway, because eleven years of storytelling building up to that one moment. 
Mm-hmm. No, I can agree. Yeah. Definitely. But um, yeah, um, let's see. That, uh, then we, and then everything goes south very quickly for uh, the um, uh, for Nottingham because uh, the taxes get uh, doubled. Oh no, wait, they get tripled. Little uh, Pr- Prince John just wants to squeeze every ounce of money out of the villagers as possible, yeah. and uh, Friar Tuck has just had enough. And and even the rooster, if you can't pay your taxes, you're thrown into the jail. Even <laughs> I was like, even the rooster couldn't pay his taxes, and he's a it's, minstrel. Yeah, it's quite it's quite surreal though. The the scene that we get after everyone's in jail is really really impressive for the time because it's yeah. raining outside. So you've got the automatic, you've got the effects of the rain, and even when we see the rooster inside, you're still seeing the rain outside. Which yeah. is such a nice touch, and the the whole scene, all the colours are completely dampened down, yeah. and it's really really impressive, and it's really it's quite it's quite an emotional scene really, seeing yeah. everyone kind of chained up and locked up, and then there's a, if I remember right, there's a scene where the the mother rabbit is feeding all the the, oh, the young rabbits, man, it's only that, like one one bowl, that ah that that is gut wrenching. On a yeah, I mean, on, on a lot of levels, it's it's really rough. And then you get the scene just after that where they they're, they're in the they, church, fry talk with the bell, and you've got the church mouse playing the organ as well. Yeah, but not just that. And um, see when they're still in the jail, they, they there's a bit where you see more all of them trying to eat like as little food as they've got, and there's a bit where there's these mouse. Oh these mice, my and god! Oh man! A bit of bread and a crumb falls, and they all run for it because they're so hungry. And the chains pull them back, and it's really got. I mean, as a kid, I hated it. It really made me quite sad. Yeah, I say, and 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 I mean, I say, and this, and dare I say, the song didn't really didn't really help in any way, but uh, but it it did just add to that feeling of just despair and misery. Not in Nottingham. That's that's the name of the song here. Oh boy. I mean, wow. it's, it's it's true despair on screen, and it's really. It, it grips you so much and it really it is heart wrenching and that's at that point that's when you you need Robin Hood to prevail and I think it really does set up mm-hmm. the, the the kind of final moments of the film really well yeah I think, I think, just, I think just, just just that whole scene in general everything from like the mm-hmm. the jail the church fry tug being um put into the jail as well and and the the song as well it freaking hurts to watch Mm-hmm. It's just it's and and it's so nice because if I remember right, uh, I might be wrong here, so I don't know if you remember. They when Friar Tuck's in the church, he, he rings the bell just to try and give people a bit of hope. Yeah, and that just shows you how hopeless this this world they are in now is. Yeah, that just ringing the church bell is wait, the only thing he can do to try and reach out to people and give them a wee bit of solace. Yeah, let's say. Let's say, let's say, let's say, it t- turns out Fry Talk's not actually being put to jail. He's actually gonna, he's actually gonna be, um, he's gonna be hung. Mm-hmm. Pleasant. Which again, d- that's so dark for a Disney film. Yeah. Because I think usually when there's deaths in Disney films, for example, the one I'm thinking of right now is Little Mermaid. When Ursula dies, she's getting stabbed with a full ship. Like they're usually Ooh. over the top. Very few Disney films have a really dark death in them. The one that comes to mind is like Tarzan. Clayton at the end, yes. That's the kind of... And then all you see is the lightning flash and just his silhouette, the, mm-hmm. the shadow of his body hanging there. That's all you see. Disney, Disney have a have a, an act with having really dark moments and really light-hearted things. And that because this is a punishment that was given to people in that time in England, it, it really drives home that this, this did happen. And it being a kid, it obviously kind of goes over your head. But now, yeah. being an adult, knowing these things happen, yeah. it's really surreal that they they did that, yeah. and I still can't really get over it. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think it, I don't think anybody would be able to. But uh, and but like you get you get Robin as you get Robin disguised as the uh, uh, as the blind man again, um, and and then and then a plan and then a plan is hatched to just uh, plan is hatched to get everybody out of jail 
and at the same time getting all the money that's uh, all of it somehow in uh, Prince John's room with little hiss in a cradle at the foot of the bed. <laughs> Very odd choice. <laughs> yeah. But um, you see, another fine example of how spoiled um, Prince John is, he has a bag of money next to him as a cuddly toy in his bed. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Which begs the question, what is he even spending this money on? <laughs> I would love to know. Yeah, and and from what I can, from what I can gather, he doesn't have a vault in the castle somewhere. No, I mean I, I don't even I don't even think vaults were around at the time. Well, at, at the time the film is set, anyway. Yeah, I'm sure they had like it was just probably at the treasury room. But More than likely. That. More than likely. Yeah. Hence the uh, hence the treasure chest we saw at the start of the film. Mm. But then um, we we move back on. Um, and I must admit, there's another disguise coming up that I just I need to understand why people can't understand that this is Robin. <laughs> it's just it's just a sheet with a, a sock on his nose, essentially. To try to try and be one of the vultures. Oh yeah. come on, that <laughs> it's actually ridiculous. That's the, that's the sort that's the sort of thing you would expect somebody to make a kid as a Halloween costume on a budget. Yeah, I mean, literally, that's a, that's a five-minute costume right there, and it is... Yeah, exactly. It's so funny that we go from him dressing up as a stork, which is so spot-on, Yeah. to the... To this grab-and-go... You go. can still see the folk under him, if I remember right. You can still see, like, the only thing... Yeah. It, like, you can still see all these fur. The only yeah. thing you see is this random sock. And th- and then and then you've and then you've got little John managing to yeet the sheriff into into the cell and then disguises himself as the sheriff, which is just oh, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, if I mean, if anything, it do- if anything, this is probably the most convincing disguise that little John has had throughout the entire film. But- yeah, yeah, definitely. I do think the the scene that we get next where they release everybody, I think is so is such a good scene. It's so heartwarming. Yeah. And the, the wee rabbit um, that he gave the bow and arrow to and stuff starts yeah. like running out as if I'm gonna take on all the bad guys, where are they? And uh <laughs> Briar oh, has lesson. to pull him back and is like, Whoa, take it easy, boy. They're just back <laughs> yeah. at jail, take it, chill. Yeah. And then oh boy. Uh we see it's like Let's see, let's see, let's see the little pulley system for, for, for the money. Mm. It. It's all going to plan. He's, Robin's got the last bag on it. And then Prince John and Sir Hiss, they wake up. They're just like, gods! And, it, and, then, and, then, and, then and then we get that point in the film where you get, um, where you get uh, the, the final battle and it involves the side characters climaxing with their uh, the main characters. This would this again also very prominent during the uh, the Renaissance period. Yeah, the 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 kind of climax as well really I think goes to show how childish Prince John is as well, because yep. just before he wakes up, you see him sucking his thumb and like rubbing his ear, <laughs> and then throughout the whole time he's he doesn't really act like a king. And I think that's such an important part. Is he never actually really becomes like a king like? He's always just a child. And I think that's why in this film, he's so hateable. But it works so well because obviously you're supposed to hate him. Yeah. But he's a man-child until the end. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, was it? Um, was it uh, everybody, everybody, everybody manages uh, to escape apart from, apart from uh, Tag Along, the, uh, the, the one that ends up... Uh, a bit because of how small they are, they're struggling to keep up. And Robert's yeah. just like, right, let's go back and get them. And then, mm, caught in the gate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, he, he hands Tag along to Little John. Don't worry about me. I'll, f- I'll find another way out. I think as well, we should mention that, again, this hierarchy of animals that are, ta- like, that are guards are actually all predators. So it's like rhinos and... Yeah. Um, 
I think there was a crocodile at one point with a big axe. Like they're all top oh, of the chain. Oh, yes. So, so it, it constantly plays on this preying on the weak. Yeah. And I think it was such a smart choice for Disney to have all the guards as like, again, the rhinos specifically are very imposing. They they actually look very evil because they've got the red eyes and the and that they they're always they're not really shown in any kind of silly way. They're mm-hmm. always very stern and very imposing. Yeah. Uh... I've I've just realised something regarding uh, regarding that crocodile. Uh, he's voiced by um, Candy Candido. That's because like I mean, listening to his voice, that's the same voice as one of Maleficent's goons in Sleeping Beauty, and the chief in Peter Pan. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's crazy. Absolutely. But it's just yeah. another showing that they do reuse voice actors. But I think it's a very, I do, I do think it's a good thing. Yeah. They use a lot of voice actors because it does. I mean, the the voice work in this film was, to, for me, I thought it was very good. Yeah. Um, but all the characters sounded like how they should. Something that came across as very awkward, and I think that is just down to experience of the voice actors. Yeah, definitely. Um... And, and then we and then we and then we reach the climax, um, and it's it's this face to face confrontation with the sheriff and Robin Hood. They um, uh, the sheriff has this torch, and he 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 swipes it at, he swipes it at the curtains, and then and then just that part of the castle ends up on fire. And Robin is it is stunning to watch the yeah. hand on fire effect. It is amazing. I'm very much a. I enjoy animation for the the spectacle and how amazing Definitely. some of these things. And the the I, I must admit when I watched this scene, the actual fire itself was. I mean, it was gorgeous. If I remember right, it was, it was all swirly and. It, yeah, it definitely it felt really. So, it definitely like, felt realistic. Yeah, there was so much life in the fire. It was yeah. unreal how amazing it was for me to yeah. watch. Like I, it was a standout in the whole film. Just like, I mean. I mean, I mean, especially with how quickly it spread, as mm-hmm. well. You see, it's just... such a short part of the film as well, though. That yeah, I can't believe it had such an effect on me. Like t- for me to see that, I genuinely was like, "This is, this is beyond its time." Like this, yeah. this. I'd seen this when this film came out. I would have been sitting there like, "Whoa, this is great. This is the future." Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean that. I mean that. That was. I mean that was me with the uh, with like with like. Um... I've, I've, I've already mentioned regarding the Lion King. I've, I've already touched on that one. Another another example of uh, of uh, just a particular scene that I knew there was something special about that particular scene, um, and and I still love it to this day. It's it's the scene in Mulan, nineteen ninety eight, where she takes her dad's place in the army. The and was it the scene where she puts on the armor, cuts her hair, and mm-hmm. heads off. All that was the only things that were there were the visuals and the music to help tell the story. There was no dialogue throughout mm-hmm. that short sequence, and I see just that particular moment was just another example of how much I love those particular moments in the, in in, mm-hmm. in films in general. Because sometimes that's all you need to create to create to create art effectively. Just the visuals yeah. and the music. To help drive the story along. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, like I say, this film, the, as much as it reuses a lot of things, the standout parts to me are the bits of really unique animation. Like, I've, I, and read like my memory. I mean, I could be wrong here. Mm-hmm. The, I can't remember anything even emulating that kind of detail in like a fire effect. Like they, they do have like the kind of the usual kind of effect of fire that they have. But when this mm-hmm. fire first comes out, it's when he's climbing on the tower. Yeah, it's something very unique to this film, I think. Like, I don't remember seeing anything like it in any of the other films, and it's yeah. really, really, really smart. And I'm <laughs> still really impressed with it, to be honest with you. Yeah, let's say, let's say, but let's say, but um, let's say, another great example as far as like the, the fire effects are concerned is when you've got Maleficent's transformation towards the end of Sleeping Beauty, mm-hmm. she's surrounded by this green fire in front of Prince Philip, and then you just get this huge explosion as he turns into a freaking dragon. Yeah, that's insane. Like, it, it's so good. Like, they, they do have like a kind of, I would say, a, a usual kind of effect they, they draw for fire, 
And, and both of them, was, the series talking about they make it unique by having its own personal little bit of animation. And that's what they did right here as well. They, It's so impressive that just adding a tiny bit of animation can really make something look so unique yeah. and just breathtaking. But yeah, I was like, See, we reach the climax. Uh, Robin Hood ends up jumping into, he ends up jumping into the uh, uh, the moat, uh, mm -hmm. which which is which is uh, for those that don't know what a moat is. The moat is uh, is uh, the water area that surrounds um, the castle, um, and you've got the guards shooting all shooting these arrows, and it and it looks like they it looks like they managed to hit him. And, uh, and and then all you see is just the hat rising to the surface with an arrow in it, and yeah, the, and the emotion the emotion that the characters have after seeing that is is really really quite on. Yeah, but 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 then you've got that little kid. You're just like, oh, he's he's got to make it. Surely he's got to make it. I mean, that that kid. How optimistic was that kid, even in the most dire of situations at that moment? Yeah, I mean, it really is quite a splendid thing to watch. And you, the really, really cool thing to me was on that scene, see if you watch the kid's eyes, they mm -hmm. actually glaze over. You actually kind of see the almost kind of stupidness of his eyes because he's about to start crying. And then when he oh. sees, obviously... We see that he has the reed pipe under the water, and he's actually yeah. made it. It's like the, the animation on it is so spot on because his face just lights up. He's like, "Look, wait, don't go, look." Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really impressive, and it's such a uh, the uh, the how much emotion I felt in that scene. Like yeah. as a child, you're always in that way of you. He could be dead. Like yeah, as a kid, I believed that he was, and then when I seen. That that essentially the rabbit kind of was around. I would imagine around the age that I was when I first watched the film. Mm -hmm. It really was gut wrenching. Yeah, and and of course Robin Hood being the and then Robin being the prankster he is, he just spurts the water out and it's just like, "Yep, yeah, I'm okay." Yep. And <laughs> and then Prince John, he just it, it's the last straw with Sir Hiss. Poor guy. Yeah. In fairness, the, the, the castle's on fire. He's just lost all his money and he's just let an outlaw go. And so Hiss is like, well, I told you so. So in <laughs> fairness, that's the one time I would maybe be like, well, probably shouldn't have known, said anything. Yeah. What goes around comes around. Yeah. And he's still acting like a spoiled little brat Well, they, they mention it's his mother's castle and he's like, oh, ah, he's mommy! And sucks his thumb again. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then, and then we, we then we've reached the, we've reached the end of the film now, folks. Uh, we've still got one more scene to do. Uh, see th those those wanted posters, pardoned by King Richard, yeah. and and then and then with the wedding bells, I say, I say, Alan, I say, the rooster. He's just like, oh, sounds like someone's getting hitched. Kids wouldn't understand what getting hitched means. No, they wouldn't. Definitely not. Un unless it's unless they directly say. They're getting married. Yeah, and the the really cool thing again is we we finally get to see, oh King, what's his name? King Richard. Ah, it's just King Richard. We yeah. finally get to see King Richard, and he's alive, which is the king of the jungle. Yeah. So it's another and, another way to play in that hierarchy of yeah. He is the king of the jungle. I say, I say, and I say, I say, and King Richard, he looks magnificent here. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, and then uh, you're probably wondering what happened to Prince John, what happened to Sir Hiss, what happened to the Sheriff of Nottingham. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, they're in jail attire and they're doing this. Uh, they're doing this work. Doing, uh, community service, essentially. Community <laughs> service. Yes. Uh, say, but I will say regarding the wedding bells and. Uh, uh, the, the the way the way they're ringing, it's the it's the same cadence as the uh, the bells that are used at the end of Cinderella. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, like that's that's the choice of being as big a Disney fan as I am, because <laughs> you do pick up on these uh, these smaller little uh, nitbits. 
But um, it, it wee... makes sense though because it, it works well because yeah. the, you've had the resolution, so you're trying. It's a good way to connect yeah. this whole feeling. Yeah, that yeah, that that moment of triumph. Yeah, yeah. It's, and uh... it's been really quite good because you get the dynamic of the king, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "I've got an outlaw for an in-law now." Which <laughs> yeah, is which, which is which is a, which it's a, it's a great callback to that line that was mentioned earlier in the film. What one was it? I remember it, but I can't remember exactly what it is. I was like, well, I said, I said, the, the fact it was the same line that was used earlier in the film. I said, oh, yeah. I, said, yeah. I, said, I, I can't pinpoint who it was that said it, but uh, but yeah, I, I just thought, that, that, that I just thought, that's, that's a great callback. It's the bit where it starts like kneeling over laughing. It just, it makes him feel like an honest to God human being. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, and then you've got, and then you've got that one last arrow. Uh, that, that ends up being shot from uh, shot from the crossbow. I think just like just ricocheting all over the place, and and it's in the sky, and then boom, right into the, right into one of the hearts and on the uh, on the carriage. It's just uh, it's so it's that's a perfect end of the film, really. Yeah. Because you think of Robin Hood, the first thing you're going to think of is a bowman, someone who uses a bow. Yeah, better definitely. than anyone else. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. it's it's so it, it adds a little bit of chaos to the last scene, which I think is so Robin Hood. <laughs> you kind of yeah. needed it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So yeah, and uh, there we go. That is it. Uh, Robin Hood and uh, uh, Maid Marian are married, and uh, there we go. We live happily ever after. So there we Even go. Even though that... we've spoiled the film, I assure you, it is worth the watch. Yeah, definitely. Do assure- should I give it a watch? Yeah, I think, I think, and 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 as in, of course, that's one of the reasons why I always have that spoiler alert in place mm. at, at at the start before we actually discuss. Well, in fairness, I think something we've not really said yet is Robin Hood. At the time when this came out, Robin Hood. This I knew of the story of Robin Hood before I watched the film, and a lot of the way I was introduced to fairy tales mm-hmm. was through Disney films. But I previously knew of Robin Hood before I watched the film. So I knew the story before I'd watched film. It was one of the first Disney films I think I'd ever been in that position. Oh. And I think having the twists of them being animals really helped make it more involving for me, especially as a kid. Who yeah. The story is very set in real life. As much as I know it isn't, but the story is very realistic compared to a lot of the other ones that have magic and things in them. Mm-hmm. So to add that wee bit of Disney magic to change all the characters into animals, I think really helped. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, there we go. That being said, uh, back to the Kingdom of Isolation logo in the background. So now it's time to get to the scores. Now, whew. well, so, so um, I said for, th- for those who don't know how the scores work, I've got, f- I've got five categories here. I've got the story, the characters, the visuals, the... Uh, the soundtrack and the uh, and the, the legacy of uh, the film, like the legacy the film uh, mm. has left since its release. Um, so, the story, the story, I, the story. It was a very, very strong line. It was, it was a, it was a, it was a great, uh, great interpretation of the um, of uh, of the, of the legend of Robin Hood uh, mm. himself. And. The uh, I say the characters though uh, the characters also got a nine. I say it's just um, I say I say like one I say the probably the big criticism. Um, I say I wouldn't say a big criticism per se, but uh, I th- I think just um I, f- I feel they could have had more of Robin's uh, Mary Mary because because the because you had Fried Tarkin and Alan they they were just they were just they were their own side characters. So so it would it would have been great to be able to have them like. Um, together, in, in even if, even if it was just like for the last scene where Robin and Marion, um, where they get married, it, it'd be great if they had all of uh, Robin's merry men as like extras in the background at the end. Yeah, especially in the story, the merry men are such a prominent part of it. They weren't, yeah, really in this film, at least for the most part. Yeah. I say, I say, I say that, that's the only thing that really, that's the only thing that really stops you from giving uh, giving it a ten. I say, I say. I say, Prince John, Sheriff of Nottingham. I say the way the way 
so the way the way they were animated then the way the way they're uh, the way they're portrayed you just know right out of the gate that they come across as just really unlikable right out of the gate and throughout the film i think it that that detestability it continues building throughout the film mm-hmm. and it work it works it, it works in favor of disney because because i say i just love I just love the fact that you've got, I see you've got Prince John, I mean, just like a spoiled little brat throughout the entire film. And then sh- the sheriff of Nottingham, you just, he's just like, ugh, you're just like, uh, dare I, I, get, I, get dare, dare I say, probably the most corrupt Disney mm. character that's ever been, uh, that's ever been made. And, and again, a term I don't use very yeah, often. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, visuals mainly because mainly because of how much was recycled. Uh, I, I could I could only really give it a seven, but that's just mainly because from mainly because of uh, how much they had recycled. But apart from that, like you said, the fire flies with the fire and the fire at the end. Um, those I say those moments stop it from those moments stop me from putting the score uh, any lower. I say, I say my, my biggest criticism is just that there was just so much recycling throughout the film, but. Yeah. Nothing, but yeah. Uh, soundtrack, uh, soundtrack. I gave an eight again. I say, I say the score wasn't really, wasn't really uh, that prominent throughout the film, but uh, but the songs, the song, the songs were great. And uh, the last thing to touch on is, of course, the legacy of uh, the film. Uh, so where do we begin with this? Um, Rotten Tomatoes, where are you at? Well, that's uh, it's um, the um, the score on Rotten Tomatoes isn't exactly that great. Fifty four percent on Rotten Tomatoes, not great. So, so like I say, I say, the film did get positive reviews when it came out, but again, the reception became more mixed as time went on, uh, and a, a score of fifty seven on. Um, uh, on Metacritic, um, they had it had two re- had their two releases. Uh, it it premiered at the uh, Radio City Music Hall, uh, which uh, which was used uh, for a number of occa- on a number of occasions for like various film uh, premieres. Uh, I say, um, bear with me, folks. Um, it's uh, it's it's still it's still there it's still there today, uh, it's uh, it r- right in the heart of um, right in the right in the heart of the uh, of, of New York City, and it's operated by Madison Square Garden Entertainment. Believe it or not. So there you, there you go. Nice another little factoid there for that. So mm-hmm. I'll say it was. Um, so the Radio City Music Hall, November eighth, nineteen seventy three, and it got re- it got a re release in nineteen eighty two. Uh, the box office earnings, uh, its initial run, uh, its initial run got it a total of twenty seven point five million dollars, and then the um, and then the uh, re release in nineteen eighty two gave it a a, to- a grand total of between thirty two to thirty five million. At the uh, worldwide box office, taking both really, taking both, um, t- t- take, taking the uh, uh, taking the re-release into account as well. Um, so like, so like, so like, a, uh, like so, uh, so as far as the as far as the Oscars are concerned, uh, the song "Love" uh, nominated for best original song at the Oscars, but it lost to "The Way We Were" from the film with the same name. Uh, the song the song whistle stop ended up becoming the hamster dance and uh <laughs> sorry to us <laughs> yeah uh yeah and uh, <laughs> it it was and uh, at normal speed it was also used for a super bowl commercial for t mobile uh so the song udalali uh, was featured in a 2015, 2015 commercial for Android using animals of dis- different species playing together. 
And so some of the characters from the film also cameoed in um, in Mickey's Christmas Carol as well. Uh, and it was it was nominated in the uh, top ten animated films for the uh, American Film Institute. And uh, going back to the song Love, it also featured uh, in Fantastic Mr. Fox. That just seems so so well of a fit. Yeah, because it's because it's uh, it's the scene. So it's it's the scene in uh, it's the scene in Fantastic Mr. Fox where you've got uh, Mrs. Fox doing his painting, uh, doing her painting. Mr. Fox just relaxing, and uh, one of his kids doing some uh, doing a bit of diving, and and you actually, and you actually hear the song in the background uh, during during that particular moment in the mm -hmm. film. Uh, there's also a live action adaptation on the way. Uh, it was announced in April 2020. It was reported that Disney is developing a live action CG hybrid remake of Aladdin with the same kind of oh, anthropomorphic characters uh, from the 1973 film, uh, with uh, Kari Granlund doing the writing and Carlos Lopez Estrada doing the directing with Justin Springer. I doubt he's related to Jerry Springer, but that, we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, Justin Springer doing the uh, producing. And the remake is going to be exclusively on Disney+. Plus. I'm just hoping it's not as lazy as the live-action remake of The Lion King. Yeah, that... I will put some doubt on it, because it seems like a very hard film to remake well. Yeah. Especially with the, in my opinion, the original being so well done. Yeah. I, I do agree that there is some room for improvement and they very well could do some good things with a CG remake, but they would need to be very careful mm -hmm. as not to lose the original kind of magic that it has. Yeah. So but of course the um but of course this um I think, I th but me mainly for mainly for the uh the critical reception it's released it's had in in recent years. Uh, it, it stops you from giving the legacy score uh, anything higher than an, an eight, but, um, but like I say, with what it's left with what it's left behind, with um, with with the Oscar nomination, the some of the characters cameoing in Mickey's Christmas Carol, uh, one of the so uh, one of the songs being used in other films, um, but yeah, uh, a score of eighty two percent, which. Which, given the time period, it's a very respectable score for, for a Disney film of that um, particular period. Uh, and, where it, and where does it fit on the board? It's, it fits very nicely in between Alice in Wonderland and Dumbo. So, uh, not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, quite good, not quite good enough to reach the top 10. Um, it very much is dated compared to some of the earlier works. I think yeah. I mean, they, they were such a new experience. But yeah, I still definitely. think that it does hold its own. It has, it has its own merits, absolutely. Mm. But anyway, uh, I know, but anyway uh, that, that is it for this uh, latest episode of The King of Isolation. If you enjoyed this, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be dream chasers like us, and you, you can hit you can hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad, so you don't miss anything that uh, that I do on this uh, channel. The next episode that's going to be coming out is going to be the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and oh my word, I am really looking forward to covering one of the most iconic characters in their, in their children's uh, literature. I've got a busy weekend ahead of me getting all this editing done. Uh, and until, and on that note, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.